potato uh, Hi everyone. So we're about to get started with our next presentation for the food security series. So right here we have John Alcock from Sunshine Farms in Kelowna and he is going to be talking to us with seed saving for food security. So I'll pass it over to him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm John Alcock from Sunshine Farm in Southeast Kelowna. Uh, we've been there for 36 years. Uh, we've uh, been organic beginning and certified organic since, uh, well, for about 33 years. And, uh, you know, obviously subscribe to all the uh, uh, all the possibilities of uh, certified organic. And we've, uh, we've loved being able to bring our family up in that regime uh, where they don't have to worry about what they eat. It's really nice to go out into the garden, as you know, and uh, with a basket or a bucket and pick your dinner and having it so fresh, so beautiful, and having it at your doorstep. We're we're, as gardeners and farmers, you know, we're in such a fortunate position to have a relationship with the earth. I think it's really good for one's mental health to, um, to connect with the earth, to feel the ground literally become grounded. Um, you know, to, to go even further with that, uh, growing and saving seed is that deeper connection that we can have with life cycles, with the cycles of, of the plants. And uh, it's very important. And once you start doing it, you realize how fulfilling it is. And uh, something that, uh, that really, as, as, as gardeners, we should do at least some saving seeds. Now, does uh, anybody here save seeds now to begin with? Hands. Wow, great. So I have. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to teach you guys anything. But I love I love talking about seeds and uh, and growing seeds and saving seeds. Uh, yeah. So it's seed saving. Think about it. The food plants that we have today have been developed by our ancestors. And those, those seeds, especially we'll talk about uh, open pollinated seed in a minute, but all those seeds were uh, developed by these people that were making their food taste and grow better. And according to different climates and so on. You know, you think about, we, we learned in school, I think, the, the fertile crescent in, in uh, the, the Tigris and Frates valleys and the grasses that were selected and and, uh, and ultimately domesticated. Uh, the einkorns and the wheats. Uh, same thing with in southern Mexico with Teosinte uh, being selected generation after generation to become the, uh, the uh, corn and maize that we, that we know today. But the, you know, the thing, one of the things that, that early humans obviously understood was that good genetics give rise to good genetics. And so they just kept that selection. They kept that in mind. They're not doing it uh, as gardeners. They're doing it to stay alive. And so they, they have to do it. They have to select always for, for a better... Um, for a better, uh, a better plant. So they're looking for things like drought tolerance as, as we are now in, in Southeast Kelowna, we're in level five uh, drought, which is very severe. We haven't, I think we've had one 10 minute rainstorm all summer and it's, it's really scary. It really feels scary to be in this situation. But drought tolerance, vigor, color, shape, size, flavor ultimately, um, so these are, these are things that our ancestors uh, selected for. Um, so 
why do we save seeds? Well, I have, uh, I have a, a Scottish heritage. My mother, my mother is from Scotland, and uh, it saves us money, first of all, you know. And it's, it's not why I first started saving seeds. I, I first started saving seeds because, you know, I was, I was growing, well, aside from when I did it as a child, but when we moved to the farm, I was growing, you know, a broccoli variety, and I was buying it from a, a seed company, the seeds from a seed company. And then one year it wasn't there. Okay, well, I'll try this one. No, that's not as good. I, I want that other one. So I could find it and grow it, grow it out, and then I had my own uh, green Goliath broccoli seed, which is, I think we're the only ones in Canada now that have it, probably North America. Um, but also, not just saving seeds because it saves us money, um, we can develop locally acclimatized varieties. So those, those varieties that can adapt. And it, this is especially important with open pollinated varieties that have uh, extensive genetics. So those open pollinated varieties can adapt to things like drought, to things like low input organic agriculture. Um, you know, we need to, we really need to save the germplasm of open pollinated varieties. Um, I don't know, uh, some of you may, may be going through seed catalogs in the spring and looking at more and more hybrid, uh, hybrid varieties and very rare now to find open pollinated varieties. Um, for a couple of reasons. One reason is that uh, uh, hybrid varieties are more, uh, we can get more money for them. So they're especially bred, granted, they, they require more work, um, but also uh, they don't really allow for the grower to then turn around and save seed. It's not necessarily gonna become true to that variety. It's most likely gonna be different from, from that uh, variety that we grew that first year of growing a, a, a hybrid. Um, you know, the, the uh, I guess I can go to the next slide. Uh, so by growing some of the heritage or heirloom varieties, we can help to save uh, germplasm that is endangered. Uh, those are those are those genetics that our ancestors developed. We're losing our open pollinated varieties at an alarming rate. Um, I, I used to know the numbers. I just it overwhelmed me, so I just stopped keep, keeping track. But looking for varieties that we used to grow 20 years ago, even they're not there anymore. Unless you go to uh, Seeds of Diversity Canada or Seed Savers Exchange in the U.S. So there's a couple of places that we can make uh, uh, special requests and go and, and maybe find those varieties and hopefully grow them out and save them and, and uh, keep growing them and or donate them to uh, the libraries. I'm not sure if, if the library in Salmon Arm has a, a borrow, um, a seed uh, borrowing program, but Enderby does. So up the valley from Oliver, right through to Enderby, I guess. Now there, you can go to the library and take out seeds, hopefully grow them out in a responsible manner to maintain their purity, and then bring them back, and uh, it's just like a book, right? Um, yeah, so the, another thing about, you know, why we want to save seeds is that self-sufficiency factor as well. Uh, and I mentioned earlier, it, it ties us to natural cycles and empowers us. Um, so yeah, most commercially available seed is produced for industrial or chemical agriculture. So that's another reason why we see a lot of hybrid seeds uh, that, you know, are packaged that gardeners can buy. These are the leftovers from industrial or, or chemical agriculture. They're, uh, um, they're made, you know, to use broccoli as an example. So th those broccoli would, 
all mature at the same time, they're hybrids, and so they can just go into the field and they can cut, and, and, and as soon as that cut's done, then they're going to till that down and put another crop in, um, just, just to get her done. Uh, also, uh, those varieties require more uh, chemicals uh, that often the seed companies are also chemical companies. Uh, you look at Monsanto's turned into Bayer now to try and hide themselves. But, uh, um, you know, some of, the, uh, some of the seeds that are being produced by chemical companies, uh, Roundup Ready Canola, they've even got Roundup in the name. Um, so high input chemical agriculture, uh, not made for the backyard gardener really. Um, you know, that, that just a, another thought on industrial ag is that they, uh, um, why does, you know, why is it that a tomato on the supermarket shelf can sit there for two weeks? Well, it's, it's because it's a hybrid, it's been bred for industrial agriculture, it can be picked mechanically, stowed in trailers, on the road, pumped with uh, um, ripening agents and set on the supermarket shelves. And, you know, it's, it's been said, I would, I would, at the farmer's market in Cologne, I would, I would talk to people and they, oh, my child doesn't like vegetables. Well, <laughs> who would like to taste a cardboard tomato anyway, right? And, you know, the flavor is just not there in this, in this uh, industrial agriculture vegetable. Program. It's uh, it's it's really it's really sad. I think most of you know this anyway. But um, so, anyways, plants want to make seeds. That's that's what they're there for. It's their ultimate goal. Uh, they want to. So what you want to do is cre create sufficient vegetative growth so that these plants can produce the best seeds. So you want you know to make sure that you've got good like bone meal or, or phosphorus in the soil that is really going to help with flowering and seed production. Uh, produce the maximum amount of pollen and uh, ovules in the flower. Uh, or, like in the case of uh, biennials and perennials, uh, to create sufficient storage in the root so that that, uh, that root, when it's planted out or when it is left in the garden, to produce the flowers for the next year is going to produce the best, the best crop of seed. Um, you know, there, I'm talking today mostly about pure seed because uh, that's, that's what we grow. We, we endeavor to, to make sure that those varieties that we grow are, uh, are what they say they are. They're not, they're not crossed. So we, we um, make sure that we, we do the correct isolation, the right amount of genetic diversity by having a minimum number of plants at least. Uh, I've left a chart, uh, I think it's called the Seed Savers uh, and Planting Guide um, over uh, on the table here. And uh, also some seeds, some unusual varieties, I think mostly root crops. Uh, that, that some of you may not have grown before. And so we're just trying to get them out there free so that, you know, maybe you can pick up a pack and, and, and try it next year. Uh, we also have some uh, uh, little complimentary packs of zinnia seeds that, uh, uh, that are, are promotional uh, with a little blurb on the back to talk a little bit about who we are and why it's important to support uh, local farms and agriculture. Um, so purity of seed is definitely important, but in the home garden, you don't necessarily have to worry about it too much because there's really no accidental crosses that are gonna be inedible. Um, you know, your squash varieties can cross, you know, your zucchini can cross with your scallopini. You might get, you know, a really interesting spaceship looking type <laughs> squash. And, and it's interesting. And, and even purposely doing some of these uh, 
some of these crosses. And then you can trade, say, you know, well, I've got this, uh, this great squash that um, uh, has, you know, these stripy colors or whatever, and trade them with your friends and your neighbors. Grow them out, see what they do. They're definitely going to be edible. So, as I'm sure you all know, uh, most vegetables are either annuals, perennials, or biennials. Uh, annuals producing seed in their first year, biennials producing their second year. So, that other consideration uh, is open pollinated seed. Uh, so, that seed which will produce true to type offspring. Uh, so, the traditional Jacob's cattle bean will look like its parents. It will be that creamy color with the beautiful speckles on it. Um, the real beauty of open pollinated though is that that genetic diversity. Uh, you know, it carries the ability to adapt to local conditions. Uh, not just local conditions, but the farmer or the grower as well. Uh, we, we tend to forget about these things. Uh, seeds also adapt to the people that are growing them. So if seed growers, seed collectors pay attention to the attributes they desire, then the land races or locally adapted varieties can be developed. We've done this with a, a few things. Um, the first one that comes to mind is our, what we call the Dutch gold carrot. Uh, I found a seed in, um, in Europe in the mid 90s and uh, grew it out, brought it to market. People say, oh, what happened to your carrots? Are those parsnips or are those carrots? Or, and uh, I said, well, you know, I had tasters, so wow, those are really good. And uh, so I, the, the actual name of the carrot was the yellow lobberiker. And it just seemed like a, a real big mouthful, so I changed the name to Dutch Golden because now it's Sunshine Farms Land Race, so it's, it's ours now. Um, but that's, uh, uh, it took a few years for people to start buying it at the market. Uh, just sitting beside the, the orange carrots was okay, but I was able to get white carrot uh, seed and grow that as well. Uh, the snow white, uh, we've been growing that for many years as well. And then um, Garden City Seeds out of Idaho started, uh, uh, one of my mentors, John Navazio, uh, who wrote an incredible book, The, uh, the Organic Seed Grower. Um, but anyways, uh, uh, he brought the Purple Dragon from China and, and started selling it. They started growing it and selling it through uh, Garden City Seeds. And uh, so then I had four colors. And once I had four colors, people, wow, that's beautiful. And uh, so they started, you know, I'll get a bunch of those and hey, my kids like your carrots, right? And so uh, on, on several occasions, I've had parents come up to me and say, you know, that I, I couldn't get my kids to eat vegetables, but your guys' vegetables taste really good and the color is incredible. And, and that was the thing. I remember uh, my, uh, my mom's cardiologist saying, the best thing you can do for your heart is to grow and eat, or sorry, not grow, but to eat as many different colors as you can. And uh, so that's something that I've always subscribed to. So the flip side of, of open pollinated is hybrid seed. We talked about that briefly. Uh, seed, seed companies produce it uh, primarily for uh, uh, being able to, to mechanically harvest and ship and sit on the supermarket shelf for weeks and all of that stuff. And uh, you know, so what we've seen in growing some hybrid seed is that if you uh, if you save uh, if you save the seed from a hybrid plant uh, it doesn't really look that great in the following uh, that second generation um, you know often produce undesirable flavors or shapes colors sizes that sort of thing uh, something that I've been working at a little bit too is dehybridizing. It's something that if you want to try, it's kind of interesting. So you grow a hybrid variety, like say the, what I did, the Sun Gold tomato. I grew it for nine generations before it stabilized. Um, and it's a little bigger 
than the traditional Sun Gold tomato that many of you know. Uh, but it doesn't split as easily, which is really nice. Uh, a little bigger, but it's got the great flavor of the Sun Gold still. So that's one that we have been successful working on. Another, uh, another type of seed that we should uh, watch out for. What do you call for. that tomato? A uh, Sun Gold 2000. <laughs> this lady was asking. <laughs> uh, we stole their name but changed it 10 percent or whatever you have to. Uh, so another type of seed that we should be careful of is the bioengineered or genetically modified seed uh, this seed may have been patented uh, or may contain harmful genetics that could escape and get into your neighbor's garden or a, a nearby farm uh, so we've got to watch out for that i think at this point too we've uh, uh, some municipalities in BC have um, made uh, laws which prohibit growing um, gene genetically engineered crops. At this point, I think uh, what we have to worry about, and not necessarily on the seed racks in the hardware stores and so on in bucker fields, uh, soy, corn, summer squash, the fruit neck squash, and possibly beets because now I don't think anybody in the valley is growing G GMO beets but uh, if you buy sugar and it doesn't say cane sugar on it it's likely made from sugar beets GMO sugar beets so we should we should watch watch for this sort of thing uh, so let's see yeah we talked about annuals um, so biennials um, produce seed in their second year. Um, examples, carrots, celery, cabbage, beets, chard, onions, parsnips. Um, so these, these need to be vernalized. So if you want seed from these guys, you've got to keep them in a cooler or a root cellar uh, between or below 10 degrees and obviously above zero, for, especially for some of these, um, for a minimum of 90 days. Uh, they can also be mulched. I, you know, I'm, I must admit my parsnips, I don't necessarily pull them and select them. They overwinter so well in the garden that uh, and I, I'm, I'm growing two varieties, not in the same year, obviously, uh, but the long, the Andover, and then the Guernsey half long for heavier soils. Um, so these ones I do leave in the ground uh, through the winter and they, they do just fine. And some of them you can dig up in the spring and have some really, really tasty uh, parsnips. Um, the uh, brassicas, uh, things like kohlrabi, cabbage, what we do is we, uh, we dig them up in the fall, we uh, trim the, all the loose leaves back, uh, and put them in boxes sprinkled with moist shavings and again in the root cellar or cooler uh, between 0 and 10 degrees Celsius. Um, so you know those uh, those plants will throw up their flower stalks in the spring and uh, if uh, you know I, this this year I did kohlrabi the giant kohlrabi and uh, had a nice a nice row. Uh, they were just going to start to flower, and the deer came in and just <laughs> ate all the flower tops on them. And uh, so I had a, a cabbage called Red Express, and I thought, well, those kohlrabis aren't going to do anything. The Red Express cabbage are 45 day cabbages, and so I just let them go produce flowers, and uh, hopefully, I will get some seed from them. Beautiful cabbage really early, small, uh, you know, not, not overwhelming like the mammoth red rock or something like that. Um, so things like our, our uh, carrots, so what we do um, is we select them in the fall when we're harvesting. So uh, good color, good shape, good size. We cut the bottom off, we check them for flavor, sometimes carrot can get a, a bit of a bitterness. Uh, let that, where it's been cut off, let it callous before you 
before you put it back in its put it in its storage. Uh, we store <laughs> in just in perforated poly bags in the cooler. Works really well. Um, I used to do it in the root cellar. <clears throat> Excuse me, but the root cellar was too variable, and I would start losing some of the roots. Um, so that's why I built a cooler actually, so so that I could properly vernalize my root crops. Um, but uh, you know, one of the really interesting added benefits of of growing your biennials, especially your roots, is those flowers uh, that that come up in the spring and flower all summer. The amazing biodiversity that, that you see. Uh, I don't know how many different types of wasps and bees, flies come to the uh, you know the are uh, carrots or parsnips or any of that family, the umbellifery family. Uh, it's just incredible the, the amount of biodiversity that happens there. And one of the things that I've really noticed, and I try and plant my cabbages or my brassicas around where my carrots are flowering, because those critters that are coming in, those little wasps that are coming in, they're also taking the aphids and the soft-bodied insects off your adjacent crops. And so, the, and the birds that come in to eat your seeds in the fall too, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just really interesting what happens in, when you plant those root crops out. So, um, biennials, we talked about open pollinated seed, I'll leave that up for a second. Uh, so at, uh, in the fall, um, when you're, uh, you've left some of your seeds go, pretty like with lettuce, pretty much takes a whole season to develop a good uh, batch of seeds. Um, you know, they'll throw up uh, their flower stalk. Some of them, like uh, the one, we, uh, it's called the Bolsa Chica. It's a very succulent uh, oak leaf style. You can pick the leaves off that almost until the, the yellow flowers appear. And the bitterness is just barely there. Um, so that's a that's a really good variety to uh, uh, to grow for seed. Uh, really fills out a salad mix beautifully too. Uh, th but things like beans, peas, radish, okra, these are dry crops. So we let them dry off in the fall. Uh, what I do is is just clip the stalks, stuff them into feed bags, and uh, and then just stow them somewhere where the rodents aren't going to get them. Rodents don't really bother beans, peas, radish, um, okra. I haven't grown enough of it to see. But, uh, anyways, on tarps, fold the tarp over, do a dance on it. Uh, just, you know, shatter those pods and then pick up and winnow. Uh, in the early days, we've got some winnow machines now, but in the early days, we just would pour uh, our seeds into a five gallon bucket and then uh, have a tarp on the ground, a table with a fan on it and pour your bucket and, and all your chaff blows off and your, and your, uh, your seed lands in, in the other two buckets or in the other bucket. Uh, those should be also uh, dried under cover and somewhere where it's well ventilated our hay shed worked really well for that for years. Um, spinach, I'll just mention it briefly, uh, in case some of you don't know, has both male and female uh, plants. Uh, only the female will form seeds, uh, and that should be dried off in the garden as well. Um, if you start to see them fall or shatter, then clip those and put gloves on when you uh, when you strip the seeds off the stalks because they have a lot of those uh, prickles on them. Um, to, for seed purity, we, we should really watch for uh, Latin names. And most seed companies, not all seed companies, on the seed packets have the Latin name. We, I was adamant that we were gonna do it for every seed that we produced, but not all seed companies do it. So the, the What's especially important is the genus and species. So carrot, daucus, carota, um, 
or to maybe as a better example, uh, squash, uh, like uh, zucchini and acorn squash, or uh, cucurbita pepo. And so those will cross pollinate with one another. But the, uh, the cuc uh, pepo will not cross with the cuc uh, moshata or the cuc maxima. The moshata would be the butternut, or the maxima would be uh, the buttercup. So just watch your Latin names on those, uh, and they, they will cross-pollinate um, if they're the same species and genus, obviously. Um, peas and beans are self-pollinators. Uh, there's lettuce, there's lots of self-pollinators out there. We like to uh, still have a separation between those if we can, and again, that, the chart, the heat saver guide, that I left over here gives you some numbers on that. Uh, again, it's not imperative, but uh, you will get a, a nicer, more pure seed if you subscribe to, to those numbers. Uh, and I'll just mention the uh, Brassica oleraceae we talked about broccoli earlier. Well, there's an example of a genus and species that has a lot of varietals. So broccoli is the same genus and species as cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, you know, so some kale, Romanesco. Uh, so although they look very different, they're the same genus and species. So they will, they will readily cross-pollinate because bees love them and they will, uh, they will uh, grow So processing seed, I see it, Shoe Swap Seed Savers back here has uh, some information on like processing tomato seed. Um, this, uh, we, we process tomato and cucumber uh, pretty much exactly the same way. Um, we, we pick our tomatoes uh, and or cucumber, scrape the seed out or squish the seed into a bucket, mix it with water, keep it in a warm place three or four days Stir it daily. Um, your, uh, it should be in a warm place. We, we usually do most of ours either in the cold frame uh, where it's warmer and, or in the greenhouse. And so stir it daily. Your viable seeds will sink to the bottom. You pour off your mash. You get a good fermentation going. The fermentation breaks down those gel sacs uh, that, that is around the seed that actually has natural germination inhibitors in it. So that, you know, although I have seen tomato, not our tomatoes, I have seen tomatoes with uh, seed actually germinating inside. Yeah. I don't know what's going on there. And in the compost. Yeah. So yeah, scoop out or squeeze the interior into a bucket, warm water, wrap off the top. Uh, and so I, uh, I pour that, take that bucket with the seeds all just in the bottom and you've got clean water. Pour that into a, like a screen type, window screen type colander. And then I have a towel on the counter and I take that colander and I just tap it on the towel. And it takes a lot of the water away and uh, that, that seed will form a ball, whether it's cucumber or tomato, it'll form a ball. And then you just take that ball out knock it onto, we dry uh, usually on boards, uh, the dry boards that will absorb the, any moisture in the seed. Spread it out really good. Make sure you label everything. Even if, oh, I'll, I'll remember what that is. Always label, always, always, always. And uh, whether it's, you know, wet seed or, or dry seed, uh, it's something that's very important. Uh, you may have developed a new variety, but you're not sure where it came from or what it is. Um, yeah, so cucumbers, the same. Uh, make that ball in the bottom of your colander and then, and then spread it out. Uh, I use a culinary whisk to really get things going when I'm fermenting too. Um, peppers are obviously easy. Uh, so a rule of thumb, is to dry off 
uh, your seed to the point that when you bend it, it breaks. Uh, so squash, cucumber, tomato even. Uh, you know, um, a couple of weeks at, at relatively low humidity. Uh, for uh, seed storage, uh, the Holy Trinity is cool, dark, and dry. So that's how you, that's how you store your seed. Um, so people talk about freezers. Uh, and yeah, that, uh, that can work. If, but if your seed has a little bit of moisture left in it, uh, it may rupture the cells by freezing it. So you, you may lose some. Your seed, it's always good to germination test it in the spring anyway before you do a, a, a specific planting. Some seeds like uh, parsnip, leek, onion, corn, don't have very long lives, uh, even if they're really well, uh, really well stored. Um, but uh, the temperature, cool, dark, and dry, between seven and 15 is optimum. Uh, let's see, what I that name. Broccoli and cabbage, all the same. Yeah, so a few cardinal rules. Uh, always collect your seed from your best fruit or vegetable plant. And these, these are gonna carry through. So your genetics are gonna carry through. Select for the characteristics that you're looking for uh, from your best plants. Earliness, vigor, color, taste, size, uh, flavor, the characters that you desire. So you allow them to fully ripen. Your tomatoes, make sure they're fully ripe. Any of your brassicas, your lettuce, that sort of thing. Um, I think we'll get to the lettuce in a sec. Uh, look for true to type when you're selecting uh, to collect seed as well. And things like drought tolerance we talked about. Um, insect or uh, disease resistance. Uh, if you notice that that potato plant doesn't have any potato beetle on it this year. It's a crazy potato beetle year. So keep your tubers from from that. Don't don't eat them. <laughs> Put them in your in your cooler or your wheat cellar and then plant those out if you're saving your own potato seed. Uh, hardiness too, obviously. So uh, something that uh, uh, that will maybe take a few degrees of frost on either end of the season the plant itself or or the uh, the fruit the product in, in the fall um, productivity of course uh, you know you may have uh, you may have a tomato plant that has you know some beautiful fruit on it but it's only got seven or eight and you know you you should be looking for at least 10 pounds of fruit per plant uh, interesting type as well so if, uh, if you're not necessarily growing for purity, or even if you are, if you see an interesting type, you can save that, set it aside. Again, mark it really well. Um, and something that's really important too, uh, if you're gonna save your seeds kind of year after year after year, you have to do something, you need a minimum number of plants. Again, uh, the, uh, the seed saver guide over there has it. To, you need a minimum number of plants to prevent inbreeding depression. So you, after a few years, you may start to see that you don't have the productivity or the color or those traits that you're, that you're, uh, that you're looking for. And that's likely, likely the, the result of inbreeding. Uh, I saw it in uh, Rebecca when we first moved to the farm. There was Rebecca growing everywhere. Well, we just let it keep going. And after a few years, the plants got smaller, they didn't get as many blooms. And uh, so, you know, I bought some, some new Rudbeckia seed, planted that, and wow, this is great. But uh, it's just something that, uh, uh, that we need to uh, uh, make sure that we pay attention to. We want, we want the maximum genetics as possible. Something, something else uh, about your garden, and you think about seeds, and people talk about, oh, the garden looks really seedy, or, you know, there's lots of weeds, or whatever. Well, when you get, I know my neighbors are, 
you know, I've just moved to this new place and and uh, my son has taken over the farm now, but we're very close to the farm and, and just enough to, to get isolated for some varieties. Um, and they see, you know, they see my carrots coming up. We're, you're growing flowers. And, yeah, well, we're actually growing seeds and, you know, the kohlrabi, that's for seed and uh, the carrot, uh, these white flowers, that's carrot seed and, and those tall ones, that's beet seed and, and I, I just want to talk briefly about how the textures in your garden can change and how the flowers that are coming are beautiful and how they do expand your the biodiversity in your garden and, and help to control pests and disease. Um, so yeah, interesting shape, texture, and color to your gardens. Um, and something else that I haven't mentioned, the replanting of stored roots from last year often have beautiful fragrances. I don't know if any of you have grown beet seed, but at, right at dusk, when the beets are in flower, and beet flowers are ridiculous, they, you wouldn't even know they were a flower, but that fragrance that comes off them is just so, so beautiful and so overwhelming. And then, of course, the carrot, carrot flower. Uh, you know, we see it, uh, I just mentioned too, the Queen Anne's Lace that grows uh, feral, wild in the hills around here, especially I think in the shoe swap where it's more moist than it is where we are in the Okanagan. Um, the, uh, uh, the fragrance from carrot flower is just beautiful. And you know, uh, carrot oil I think is used uh, substantially in aromatherapy. But I just take a walk in my garden and I get, I get lots of beautiful aromatherapy. Uh, and something else that if you are growing uh, for seeds, um, you're going to get more volunteers in your garden. That means you're going to get more plants the next year that you didn't plant. So uh, I did something really lazy this year. I didn't plant carrots uh, because I grew seed last year. All I did was rototill that side and that side and left carrots right up the middle. And I was doing a, a, a multi-cross, so I was crossing uh, black Spanish with what we call spectrum, which is a, a mix of, uh, of five different uh, carrot varieties, spectrum mix. And I, that's a beautiful mix, but I did it all across. And now what I'm getting is that multicolored with the black Spanish. Uh, crossed into it, so they're purple spirals and just crazy looking stuff. Anyways, that seed's not available yet. We've got to trial it for a few years and see how it does. So, yeah, radish pods. So, like I said, we stuff those in, uh, in feed bags and then do a dance on them. separate to uh, something like that. I clean a lot of seeds in, in my bowl pans. Uh, I find that just for a relaxing winnow, you know, just throw your seed in there with maybe it's got a bit of chaff and just give it a light breath and it blows the chaff away. And, um, something else that, you know, uh, that we do because we do a lot of seed is uh, um, air filters. So I, I hate wearing a mask when I'm working. It clogs up my glasses and I just, I just drive me crazy. But uh, if you've got uh, access to air filters, when you're working, it's much better for your health. Uh, I just have a, a final. This is uh, lettuce, uh, rosa, forget the variety. So, what it looks like. That's it going to flower and that's what the uh, flower looks like. The fluffy stuff is called pappus and it helps to carry the seed away in the wind or attached to a, a dog or a deer. There's our multicolored carrots. Uh, talking about biodiversity, on this is a carrot flower with, uh, with the uh, insects on it. Let's see where our time is. 
Well, I'm just going to relate. Uh, we grew two varieties of carrots uh, a few years ago. One variety in the cold frame with insect mesh on the on the uh, on the roll-ups, and uh, but we needed to solve the problem of insects for pollination. Um, so we, we grew the other variety. We grew the other variety in the field. So the uh, snow whites were in the field, and the rouge were in the uh, uh, in the cold frame. So uh, blue bottle flies tend to be very good pollinators of carrot flower. So what we what we did was uh, we were um, trapping and euthanizing uh, Columbia ground squirrels that are inundating our land, and I would uh, so I would I would just drown them and then uh, take them and, and store them in the freezer. So that would be like. The, the previous year so uh, not the freezer in the house because my wife wouldn't let me do that <laughs> but uh, anyways we had a, a really good selection of ground, frozen ground squirrels in the freezer we uh, uh, then in the spring as soon as the uh, carrots started to show their bloom we brought those uh, those ground squirrels out just and set them on the bench uh, uh, outside the greenhouse and the, uh, the flies came and laid their eggs in them. We, we then gave them about uh, four or five days, and then we took those uh, infested ground squirrels into the cold frame and just put a little soil on them and left them, and pretty soon they pupated and the adults started to hatch. And we did a, uh, a comparison because we had a uh, a hundred foot row of snow white in the field and two fifty foot rows of rouge carrot seed flowers in the cold frame and we weighed them and they were within oh uh, what was it two hundred grams I think uh, the outside was a little bit more but uh, it was very comparable uh, the seed production in that kind of artificial regime with having the, the blue, bo blue bottles do the uh, do the pollinating Tomatoes we talked about. Uh, so, in summation, I, I, I wrote this sentence to try and crab as many, crab, cramp as many ideas in as possible that might leave you with some uh, something. Seed is a repository of the history of the plant and its selection. It has a context in both local and global levels. It is perhaps the most powerful, densely powerful force on earth. It's very small, but look at how it can become something so many times larger. It supports diversity. It contains genetic memory. It functions as living memory of the creativity of past societies. It is half genetic and half cultural. If we lose the knowledge or right to save seeds, we lose liberty and we lose history and culture to those who control our food system. Thank you. And once again, there's some uh, seeds um, over on the table there, some unusual varieties, and then uh, zinnias that, that my dad, uh, uh, varieties that he grew for years that are drought tolerant, bring in the bees, hummingbirds, butterflies, all that beautiful biodiversity and all that color. Thank you. Also, I just would like to mention that Shoe Shop Food Action, we're welcoming the mobile seed cleaner at our uh, farmer's market on Saturday, next Saturday. So if anybody's uh, interesting in try, interested in trying out any of this, you can come on down to the farmer's market. Yeah, we had them come by the farm last year. Okay. And uh, we cleaned a bit of brassica seed, I think. It was really nice. We've got some uh, winnow machines at the farm that we use. But uh, it's really nice to have these units that get things done in like 
two minutes instead of two hours. I'm excited to see what it really is even because it's like a couple different processes. Yeah, right? I think they had three units last year. Okay, yeah. yeah. And that's uh, Farm Folk City Folk. That's the, that's the poster you're holding, yeah. Yeah, same. so this is it here. And um, they're uh, BC Seeds. There's also some brochures over there from BC Seeds, which was initiated by Farm Folk City Folk uh, at the BC Seeds Conference, I think six or eight years ago. And they do, the Farm Folk City Folk do such great work in, uh, in promoting uh, safe, healthy food, uh, and uh, and organics and, and seed, so great people. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> that was so that was excellent. Yeah, you oh, explained goodness. so much. So it's the same species and genus as. Yeah, it's feral, so it's escaped. So we use we use polytive, and it's so yeah. The question was, how fine a mesh would we need uh, to um, protect a carrot seed crop from Queen Anne's lace? Um, we use something called polytive and the uh, uh the mesh i would say is i'm not i'm not good at describing mesh but it would be similar to a um, a screen window yeah. mm.